All right, here's the last lesson of Chapter 14 in our reform movement of the antebellum reform era coming out of the Second Great Awakening, the women's suffrage movement. What are the effects of the suffrage and women's rights movement uh, in the middle of the 1800s? How much reform was there? How far did they go? How far did they get? And you should be able to identify uh, some of the key demands of a key document here, the Declaration of Sentiments. That's on the back of your outline notes. Um, short brief snippet from that. Make sure you read through and answer the questions there so you can identify the key components there and what they're asking for, what they're calling for, and then also take a look at the Declaration of Independence in the few, first few paragraphs. What similarities do you see in the language and how things are used? Uh, it's a model for the Declaration of Sentiments. Women in Reform. Uh, many women reformers were Quakers. If you remember from the colonial period and Pennsylvania being settled by a large number of Quakers, uh, they were pacifists. They saw everybody as being equal, regardless of race, color, or religious background. Uh, Lucretia Mott was, in particular, one of them. And uh, she had, uh, and other Quaker women, had a relative amount of equality in their world because of that mindset. Um, however, there is going to be a little bit of a drawing line there, of course, as uh, is the case with all women in all societies, for the most part, uh, with the exception of some Native American societies. But... Uh, this uh, Lucretia Mott helped uh, fugitive slaves on the Underground Railroad. Uh, the Quakers were very anti-slave uh, for the most part. Uh, they formed the first anti-slave society in American history. And at a certain point here, she's going to meet a woman by the name of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who is attending a world anti-slavery convention in London. Europe got rid of slavery well ahead of the United States. And they're going to work joint forces to kind of work for women's rights. Uh, and uh, the meetings that were forming up as slavery grew and moved into the West in the United States uh, that were coming together to try and deal with the issue of, of abolitionism and grow uh, uh, forces to stop the spread of slavery uh, really become the breeding ground for or the beginnings of the women's suffrage movement in that women when they went to the meetings with their husbands were denied participation in the meetings themselves uh, Politics wasn't considered to be a woman's place. That was a place for the man. It was the man's sphere of the world. Uh, and therefore, they weren't allowed there. And these two particular women and others were irritated by that. And it kind of kicks off some discussion and meetings and talk about women's suffrage and their rights in all of this as well. Uh, and uh, these two are going to be very, very significant in, in this particular movement in this time period and key players in setting up the groundwork for that movement. That movement has its key starting point, birthplace officially in 1848 in Seneca Falls, New York. Make sure you jot that down, New York, and there it is. Uh, if you look at it, uh, it is centered in kind of the heart of that burned over district of New York we talked about before with religion and reform and reform movements and various reform groups are focused. We'll maybe talk about one more a little bit later on in the future. Uh, but uh, in this particular meeting, there are some men, mostly women, and they draw up a document called the Draft Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions. And it basically is a document that calls for an end to laws that discriminate against women in various fashions in religion, uh, politics, economics, uh, and that uh, women should be able to hold men's jobs, that kind of thing. Uh, but within the meeting itself, there is a pretty big debate about how far they should go. Some of that seemed a little bit too radical, even for many women. Uh, should women have the right to vote? Elizabeth Cady Stanton did say, yes, we should have suffrage, key term for you there, um, the right to vote, to be franchised. You can type that, write that in and annotate there by suffrage as well, to have franchised meant being the, uh, ac having access to the political system and being able to vote. Uh, again, some thought that this was just a bit too radical. Uh, Frederick Douglass, abolitionist, former escaped slave from Maryland, said women should have the right to vote. Um, in the end, the convention does vote to include the demand for suffrage. How does it grow? How does it grow? It grows very slowly and in different regions of the country at different rates. Uh, and there are several national conventions that get held after this in the 1800s uh, across the country. 
mostly in the northeast, mostly in that region of New England, uh, and gradually they'll start moving out into the far west, but the far west will be more accepting of women's suffrage than the east. Some of these other temperance, uh, other movements, like the temperance movement, uh, were also something that were of great concern for women. As we talked about before, women uh, saw multiple things that were wrong with society that were uh, damaging to society itself, to uh, women's children, to their husbands, and they wanted to be able to have the power, the right to vote, in order to make some of those changes and deal with some of those issues. Uh, and temperance and the issue of alcohol and uh, women being very influential in the formation of the first uh, alcohol limiting association, the Women's Temperance Association. It's called the Women's, uh, excuse me, the Daughters of Temperance is the, one of the first ones, and the later, later formed into the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Uh, was a very big movement, and, and alcohol was a very big focus for them. And uh, it was, as we've seen, a damaging piece of uh, to society and the families. Uh, if I'm going to be a good mother or a Republican mother and raise good American Republican children, I want to be able to attack those things that attack my children. Equal pay for women, college training for girls, co-education, boys and girls going together to the same school or some of the other things that she advocated and promoted. Then she meets Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Uh, they meet at in 1851 at a temperance meeting. Uh, if you remember, the Maine laws were established about 1850-51, where alcohol was banned in the state of Maine. Uh, but they become very strong leaders and partners in the suffrage movement. I'll kick out some Ed Puzzle assignment here for you in the near future to kind of highlight that a little bit more, and you'll maybe get a little bit more of the information from your fellow classmates who are doing some research in their trading cards and their topics for our reform movement. But it does grow. It does grow slow. But it tends to grow, ironically, despite it starting out here in New York and the movement having its birthplace out here in Seneca Falls, New York, um, it first starts to grow out in the West. And Wyoming, interestingly enough, is the first territory, shown here, 1869 is the territory, and then later on a state uh, to give women permanently the right to vote. And this kind of has to do with, and notice this is taking place earlier out in the West compared to the East. This has to do with the fact that moving out into the West and creating a population big enough to set up a territory requires families to be had. Most of the people moving out into the West early on are men, and you can't have a family without the women, of course. And so some of these places tended to encourage the notion and the idea that, okay, once we become a territory, and in order to become a state, we have to have even more people, let's go ahead and hang the carrot out there that women should have the right to vote to try and draw more people out to that territory and more women out there. The other reason why this kind of takes root in the West and suffrage is growing in the West a little bit more is because when women move out into the West, they tended to do a lot of work that men did. And that blurred and kind of broke down the gender roles and the gender lines and... Uh, in a way, it's uh, kind of like that uh, Jacksonian democracy where there was an increase of land available for people and more people or more men were owning land. Now they could vote and the whole property rules for voting seem to be kind of moot and, and unimportant. Uh, this expansion into the land and settling of the land in the West is also having an impact on the women's suffrage movement. And then gradually with events that we'll, you'll get into later on in some of your history courses, you'll t we'll talk about events that help bring it back into the West, in particular right around 1919, 1917, 1918. You'll see there's a big shift and it comes back into full coverage of the entire country with the 19th Amendment being passed in 1920. And this map kind of also shows that women had the right to vote in kind of stages uh, or at different levels and different types of elections it was given to them in, in stages. But 1920 is when our 19th Amendment is passed and full national suffrage occurs and that's the first presidential election that they will vote in. Some women make their own opportunities in breaking down barriers uh, to, for example, female education. Emma Willard is one who educated herself in math and science. These are topics and subjects that were only suitable or taught to men. Uh, in 1821, she set up a seminary school, which is a theological and religious school for uh, women, and to preach or teach uh, 
Religion was also considered to be something that was a man's role only, and many religious uh, uh, denominations today still do not allow women to preach to the entire congregation or to a crowd of people within their church or their organization. Very radical for a time. Mary Lyon is another one who establishes Mount Holyoke Female Seminary. These are all still around here yet today. Uh, Troy would be Troy, New York. Uh, and uh, it's happening a little bit piece by piece, bit by bit here and there. But it's only able to happen in areas where it's somewhat tolerated or accepted. The right to own property uh, is also starting to change in some states. And notice it's happening heavily in the northern states. Uh, Mississippi, for example, I guess is one, uh, an oddity here in that. Uh, California, uh, right to own property after marriage occurs uh, is something that is slow as well. Otherwise, property is all of the man's uh, ownership and legal status and legal uh, legally connected to the man. Uh, gradually, it's allowed increasingly for women to become divorced under certain conditions to, in that divorce, have shared guardianship over the children. Uh, in particular, one of the key conditions that tended to be an early allowance for divorce would be physical abuse, although in many cases that wasn't even enough. But if husbands were alcoholics and they or just completely abandoned them, uh, those were some conditions that uh, it allowed was allowed to happen gradually. Other things uh, uh, that are being broken down is in the area of careers. Uh, quite often, uh, women were allowed to uh, teach school to children, right? That motherly child rearing role was acceptable in the textile mills of the Northeast, as we've seen. Young girls would work in the textile mills, but when they got married, that's it. You've got to go right back into the home, and you're kind of expected to kind of give up that job. You earn some money so that you're ready for marriage, and you have some money to bring to uh, a man and to a family and to help start a family, and that was kind of a necessary thing and an attractive thing in a, in a partner. Um, but with elementary teachers, of course, they've earned less than men, and elementary teachers were not allowed to marry in many cases. And there were some strict rules for them in many cases for a very long time. But uh, medicine and the ministry, again, as we talked about before, are dominated by men. Uh, Elizabeth Blackwell breaks this bar uh, barrier, and she became a doctor. Uh, gradually, again, this is going to take well over uh, half of the century for uh, uh, the women's suffrage movement to start breaking out and growing in number and size, actually about a century, uh, nearly about 90 years from the 1830s, uh, from 1848 and probably about, set, uh, about 70 years from about 1848 to about 1920 for the right to vote to really happen. Uh, but there is bits and pieces and a lot of the reform and changes that always and ever happens really in the United States tends to kind of come in small pieces in a region and then it grows state by state kind of from the ground up uh, and uh, it takes on root that way but it generally takes a good period of time. Greater access to education, expanded rights within marriage in some areas, greater public awareness of issues affecting women especially the alcohol temperance thing and women and, and, and uh, children and families uh, but overall despite the accomplishments uh, they're limited yet by social customs and gender roles fitting to uh, the, that notion, again, of Republican motherhood, that the role of a woman, especially since reinforced during the American Revolution, was that you are or your role is really important, and it's not to be diminished that your job is kind of the foundation of the whole country, and we need good American Republican-minded, Democratic-minded children to keep the country growing and expanding and stable for the future to come. That's it. There's some of your left side information you can jot down. Make sure you take a look at the Declaration of Sentiments and pick it apart with some of the questions that are there. Have a good day. Make the hay. See you next time.